Yo, you are listening to the Money Matters Podcast. The Money Matters Podcast. With myself, I am Jack Mallers, the founder and CEO of Strike. And in the top right of my screen, standing at 5'10", 175, bald head, blue eyes, William Mallers Jr., who's a.k.a. my father, who's been 45 years in financial markets, 11 years in Bitcoin. How long has Bitcoin been around for 15? 11, this guy's been in this space. Dad, how you doing? Excellent. Excellent. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hey, happy St. Patrick's Day. I think I'm Irish, right? I'm all sorts of shit. Irish is one of them, right? We, you know, your middle name is Mullally. Yes, I did know that. <laughs> I did know that. That I am Irish. There's no doubt about that. What else? I'm uh, Irish, German. What's the weird one from Ma's side? Oh, well, he's, but Romanian. Something. Romanian, yeah. Yeah. A, what do they call it? A mutt? A, a, I don't know. Whatever. Sure. Yeah. I, Got the whole, I swear. Um, I'm a cocktail over here. Joanna, Joanna would search hard enough. She she found somebody who was French um, when she was taking <laughs> French in middle school or something. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, as you guys know, as Dorsey, uh, Jack Dorsey pointed out, these are recorded on Sunday, uh, released on Monday. For now, I think we should do live Monday shows. But uh, anyway, on the left side of my screen, Standing at six foot 120. How heavy are you? Uh, no, I'm 165. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Damn. He's been Punished lifting weights. He's been drinking eggs. I'll give him 160. 160 pounds. Brown hair, brown eyes. Grew up with him. Friends for a long time. But my chief of staff, one of the earliest strike employees for the last four or five years, Dylan Lito. Dylan, how are you doing? Excellent as well. Had a amazing. great St. Patrick's Day. And uh, yeah, ready to rip. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, okay. Did you guys know? I just I just learned this. I've seen the movie about a hundred times, but where um on the fugitive where Tom Lee Jones is chasing uh, Harrison Ford through the St. Patrick's Day parade in Chicago. That I just found out that is a that's a live parade shot. They just they um whoever the uh director was just took a handheld camera and walked through a plumber's union. And Harrison Ford really does grab that, um, just a hat that somebody had tossed in a trash and, and you know, disguises himself and mixes in with the crowd. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. That they just film that live like that. That's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Chicago, for those that don't know, uh, big St. Patrick's Day city. We dye the river green. The Chicago River is green. There's a parade. The whole city basically shuts down uh, to celebrate. And I think it's still going on. Let me look out of the empty closet. I can see the river from here. Um, because today is literally St. Patrick's Day. So obviously everyone celebrates on Saturday. But Sunday, I think people are still going here in Chicago. Uh, you, the financial district was whatever you think, however crazy, you know, dying the river and the parade and everything looks. The financial district's worse. I'm <laughs> guys, guys would show up like, you know, you know, your dad. Uh, my my dad, your grandpa, never drank, but he would she would just show up with a Guinness in his hand on first thing. <laughs> he wouldn't drink it just to have an just he had to have a Guinness because it was mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Day in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, good college basketball. The conference tournament uh, tournaments are wrapping up. You'll get the bracket later tonight. March Madness starts this upcoming week, so all good stuff. Um, before we start. I always say Northwestern, Syracuse, and Kansas in the final four. Yeah, well, that's just where all and I then my to family out. cannot lose. Yeah, that's that's where your kids went to school. Um, who sponsors this podcast? Nobody. You guys know that at this point. Uh, we the point of this podcast is not to make podcasting revenue, or I'm not trying to sell vitamin water. The point of this podcast is to have honest, good authentic conversation and a voice in the space that people can trust. It's a little bit of expertise. It's a little bit of a lot of bit of experience in the industry, uh, different varying angles of, I mean, Dylan as the chief of staff of strike myself as a founder and CEO, my dad, 45 years of financial markets built a lot of the Chicago finance industry and is really early to Bitcoin. Um, this is where every Monday you're just going to get real shit. 
we curse a little bit. It's probably a little unconventional, but I can tell you one thing is our opinions are ours and influenced by nobody. If you want to support us, you can buy Bitcoin on Strike, which now a ton of people do. Um, at this point, we're having a ball running this company. It's Bitcoin only. We're operative now in over 70 markets. We got Europe coming right around the corner. And what makes us different is we focus only on Bitcoin. So I'd wager to say we're probably one of the best, if not the best at Bitcoin in the world. And I don't think Brian Armstrong would necessarily disagree with me on that. I think he's focused on shit coins, right? And so we'll see which business matters most in the long run. But that's who we are, is if you want to do Bitcoin well, um, I'm happy to take you on as a customer. If you want Dogecoin, just don't sign up for my shit. But if you want to support us, do your Bitcoin stuff on strike. Um, that's what I work on full time uh, outside of this podcast. So with that, I think the first topic related to strike, just a quick plug, we launched a uh, strike business, right? I don't know, dad, if you saw that, but we got so much demand. I mean, we're just good at Bitcoin at this point and business accounts wanted to use us to buy Bitcoin. And traditionally, businesses use us for APIs, for building applications on top of our software. So a ton of Bitcoin companies that you guys know and use are used in our infrastructure under the hood. But a lot of people like, it was pretty cool, like uh, Jane's Coffee LLC or Michael's Gym LLC. They're just trying to buy Bitcoin, put it on the balance sheet, stack some sats or uh, have it as a treasury reserve and sell Bitcoin and operate their company on a Bitcoin standard or use us to store the Bitcoin securely. Whatever you guys are trying to do, we now, I think I, I, I think I tweeted it of like, hey, we got business accounts and I recorded a video and we had like hundreds of businesses immediately sign up and onboard. So it's a, it's a popular product line at this point. So I don't know, shout out to the strike team. I mean, we ship a new feature that crushes it. And it seems like every other week. I mean, the team is out of this world good. So shout out to the team. Uh, I don't know, Dill, what else did you have on this one outside of just plugging the product? Uh, if you are a business looking to buy Bitcoin and you buy Bitcoin elsewhere, we also have a switch oh, and stack true. campaign right now. Uh, if you can prove that you are a business and you're buying Bitcoin elsewhere, uh, come to Strike, buy your Bitcoin on Strike. Uh, we offer 69 basis points uh, in pricing. And I think that uh, as far as a business acquiring Bitcoin goes, it's one of the most competitive uh that's true. Out there, so. That's true. Yes. Um, as the founders, I'm I'm founder, CEO, executive chairman, controller of the board, largest shareholder by a million. No one will ever own more of this company than I will. So I I call the shots, right? And just so for my customers and for people listening, how I run strike is one, we own a massive amount of Bitcoin, like well over 50% of our treasury is in Bitcoin. Um, and we'll remain that way. And the more successful we are, the more that will go up because I only need so much cash, so many cuck bucks, a specific amount of runway that I target for th uh, the business. Uh, and then I run a really lean business. I don't have 2000 employees. I don't I don't understand why I would want to burden myself with that. So all of that and the extreme focus on Bitcoin allows us to do really, really competitive pricing and really, really high quality stuff. Because if I don't have to build a feature, when I launch a DCA feature, it's not for Dogecoin, Solana coin, Ethereum coin, uh, XRP coin. It's just for Bitcoin. And so the quality of our products is very high and the pricing is very low. And so what I said, and the, my whole thing is growth, profitability, stack sats. That's it. And so that's how I run the company. And so I turned to my employees and I said, if you, if why not, if someone's on another exchange and maybe they're more expensive than us, maybe they don't have the features like us, whatever the case is, we can run this thing very profitably at 60 at 0.69 percent at 69 basis points. So why don't we just say, hey, come on over. Um, I'll discount you as much as you want just to give a Bitcoin focused company with some integrity and some principles to try. So if you're another business or consumer that signed up years ago on some other platform, but is now taking Bitcoin a bit more seriously because you know what it means to the world and you want to give Strike a try, you just reach out to me, reach out to the company. We'll discount the pricing for you switching over and giving us a shot because we, we got a lot of confidence in that. Fair game? All right. Now, 
on to other topics. Dad, this one, I know Dylan is typically the agenda guy, but maybe not today because I want to read you a tweet from, what's this boomer's name? Samantha LaDuke. Oh, by the way, another American HODL quote. Boomer, because technically you're a boomer, Dad, but boomer is a sickness of the mind. It's not your age. I need to be clear about that. Boomer is uh, an ill mindset that thinks that the world can't evolve and change and isn't a believer in technological innovation and thinks that fiat and the dollar needs to remain prominent for America and humanity to flourish. Um, boomer is a mindset. So this boomer named Samantha called Sailor the Hunt Brothers, which for listeners of this uh, podcast is hilarious because you know who witnessed the Hunt Brothers? My dad. You know who ran the Hunt Brothers out of Chicago when they tried to corner the silver market? My grandfather. So for this chick to tell me about the Hunt Brothers is like, listen, sweetheart, I'm a Mallers. I tell you about the Hunt Brothers. You don't tell me about the Hunt Brothers. So when I saw her trying to lecture Bitcoiners about the Hunt Brothers, like, hold on a second. Um, we got to get dad's take on this on the podcast because dad, you also get so, uh, what's the right word, fired up when some anonymous 18 year old tweets about how the futures industry is going to uh, manipulate the Bitcoin market as if they know a jack shit about derivative market. So let me just read her tweet and uh, we'll get your take. And I quote, be careful who you worship or what you wish for Bitcoiners. Michael Saylor hoarding a commodity of quote unquote limited supply is not safe for hodlers of Bitcoin just because price is rising. Consider the risk. Michael Saylor is a modern day Nelson Bunker Hunt, the famous Hunt brother from the 70s who believed inflationary pressures would destroy investments denominated in paper currency. The Hunt brothers tried to hoard silver to corner the market. This lasted a decade. During the 70s, the Hunt brothers purchased the most physical silver inventory available on the market using leverage. Silver was under $2 per ounce when they started. By March 1980, the brothers managed to drive the price of silver to $50 per ounce. That's 25x according to Boomer Samantha. But by then, the Hunt brothers were no longer able to borrow money they needed to keep buying silver and pushing the, up the price. Uncle Sam stepped in. If I recall, JP Morgan helped. The Hunt brothers eventually had to start selling, and the ensuing panic caused the silver price to collapse. March 27, 1980, Silver Thursday, the Hunt brothers missed a margin call, and the market plunged. Silver crashed to under $11 from its high of over 50 and in 1988, Nelson Bunker Hunt and William Herbert Hunt declared bankruptcy. So Sailor is our Hunt Brothers. He's going to lever himself up to the tits and he's going to ruin Bitcoin, Dad. True or false? <laughs> um, no, I mean, the Hunt, the, they didn't, uh, they just ruined exchanges. They ruined, uh, you know, the New York exchanges that were unable to, um, you know, to handle positions that size. Um, but I mean, the, I think the Hunt brothers probably there's there's a lot of overlap, you know, with with Bitcoiners. Um, they became convinced the 70s double digit inflation. What do we have? Prime rate up to 19 percent or something that that um, the U.S. was un, going to be unable to defend the value of their currency. They just unfortunately did that. Um, made that came to that conclusion uh, and, and right on the eve of the greatest decade of central bank right paul volcker alan greenspan were literally rock stars during the 1980s right so just um a terrible uh terrible time to put that position on but um uh i i think there's still a lot of overlap you know you guys talk about all all the time the amount of indebtedness is going to make it almost impossible to defend the value of the dollar and uh they were just looking silver also the other problem with silver is it's not nearly as limited as people thought i mean what is the statistic 90 some percent of it that's ever been mined is is retrievable right whether it's in equipment or in your dental work whatever you can go dig it out of your teeth if if you if the hunt brothers get the price high enough um i think those stories were probably apocryphal but you did you used to hear um that you know you get the price of silver high enough people will go recover it from wherever it's buried um, whatever, if it's in 
it's in equipment or photography or like I said, even dental work, you can go find it. And that's, of course, the contrast with Bitcoin. Um, you're not going to be able to find any more of it. The the thing that that you that does inflate really, as you point out, is shit coins. If you get the price of Bitcoin high enough, yeah, you'll somebody will launch another dozen <laughs> altcoins, um, you know, and advertise them during Super Bowls and stuff. But that's you can't. Um, that's I think the big distinction um, is that the Hunt brothers just picked the wrong market. They didn't have enough yeah. muscle to own it all. Uh, whereas not the case with Bitcoin. Yeah. There, I think there's a few things to point out um, to dear Samantha. One is I think sailor is scrambling to build a position of 1% of the physical where hunt, what yeah. was the size of the hunts? Hunt owned th over 50% of the. Yeah. Physical. <laughs> yeah. Right. So sailors got, a tiny i mean sailor owns um far less bitcoin than satoshi right so um so that's one for one for two silver is a shit coin sorry i know precious metal uh advocates hate when i call gold and silver a shit coin but it is you guys gotta understand that um one to my dad's point if you get the price high enough if there's enough demand for something you're going to find more. Bitcoin's the only thing where that's not true. If I thought the iPhone 16 was going to be the best iPhone and everyone would want one, maybe I'd buy 20 of them and hoard them and try and sell them for a 10x markup. But the problem with that is if someone wanted an iPhone, they could walk into the Apple store and buy one at market price because Apple can make more. But the problem is that you can't make any more Bitcoin. So if you get silver high enough, you're going to get the silver producers to produce a ton and then dump it on the market. So silver is now more commonly used in my phone than it is as money because the other point is money concentrates. So if gold is better money than silver, if gold is harder, is more scarce than silver, then silver is going to get demonetized. It's going to end up more and more in your phone than it is as money because the world doesn't need a thousand monies. In fact, it's better if the world had one. So silver is a shit coin compared to gold. It's certainly a shit coin compared to, uh, to Bitcoin. It isn't scarce. So if someone's going to hoard it and create artificial demand and artificial price increases, then you're going to get an onslaught of selling because you're going to get an onslaught of production. Um, so they had the right idea, the Hunt brothers, as far as I'm concerned, is what you're trying to describe, is they they were terrified of inflation and tsunami of fiat currency and debasement. But they, if Bitcoin was around, so maybe sailors like the Hunt brothers, where he's the Hunt brothers 2.0, but he's doing it the right way on the right asset class. Um, but the, I guess I want, also want your opinion on, Dad, because there's so much FUD on can someone like Sailor or something like the Chicago futures products or something like the ETFs manipulate Bitcoin? There's all this looming fear of people that don't ever know what they're talking about, that they can suppress the price of Bitcoin, that by Bitcoin having financial products on the CME means that it's over, it's going to zero, people are going to infinitely leverage short it. Uh, why is Bitcoin different than gold? Like gold's Gold hasn't been able to go up for decades. Bitcoin has. Why? Why are you not afraid of well, manipulation? The greatest insurance you have against um, some Satoshi-like whale being able to manipulate the price is, I, I think, was the way it was introduced. Had had it been introduced, had it been come out of a, a financial district, had it come from Wall Street with you know, you know, like you say, money center banks promoting it. You know, you, I think that was more of a risk, but the way it just kind of grassroots leaked, you had whatever, two, three, four years before the rest of us even heard of it to distribute. And I, I just think it's on, I, I just don't think that, that there's any type of Hunt Brother potential risk because it's so, it's just so well distributed. It I, says... I it says at their peak, the Hunt brothers owned 33% of the silver market, unincluding silver owned by governments. Um, and 
so they they cornered this market they own 33 percent of it they get margin called and in theory they have to dump all of their holdings so in the spirit of channeling my inner boomer slash samantha is there any risk of for example sailor being margin called and needing to fire sale all of the bitcoin that he that he owns i don't see how i mean i don't um I mean, is he using leverage or? I don't see how either, but let's walk through this because I don't think people, let's let's finish the hypothetical. Because again, the problem is if you get silver high enough, you, like silver, the supply demand is a lot more complicated. Like for Bitcoin, the supply is fixed. So demand has to find a higher price. That's not true for anything else, you guys is demand doesn't have to find a higher price. So let's go through it. If say, let's say Sailor woke up today or tomorrow, today's Sunday. So let's say he woke up tomorrow and had to sell all of his Bitcoin. Would the price go down? Yeah. Would I buy it? Yeah. Like when people are like, Sailor's going to crash the price to 3,000. Dylan, you work for me. What do you think I would do if Bitcoin was at 3,000 with our mm -hmm. balance sheet? uh our treasury would explode i think i <laughs> would own a shit ton of bitcoin i think i'd buy some right so the i guess and then what would the price do because the point is the 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 price isn't going down because there's a lot more production that's trying to meet new demand because then the demand has to sustain it has to outpace the production but the production's fixed the production's known so if the price is only going down because someone is getting liquidated like Barry Silbert or like Sailor or like Satoshi then the price is going to be down for what a day a week a month a year we call those a bear market but bitcoin's been in a bull market for 15 years because you can't find any more so as long as people keep wanting to own it then the long-term outcome. So sure, I dare Sailor to sell his 210,000 Bitcoin to me. I fucking dare him because he'll crash it to 5K. I'll buy it. And then before I die, it'll be trading at 10 million. So go for it. I mean, I just think you, you, if you want a, say, um, a Hunt Brother type position, you say what, they had a third of all the silver. Um, I just, I don't think, I think you got a real math problem with that. So if you take the whatever... Oh, how many Bitcoin are there? 18, 19 million, right? And put them into three buckets. There's there's the third, a third, a third. Um, the first third I put are lost. Remember, Bitcoin traded for years before it even had a had a had a penny of a value, right? So hobbyists or um, you know, or or we also we didn't have good security there. We didn't have, you know, trezors and ledgers and stuff. So I'll bet you, and I'll put Satoshi's million in there also. I'll put a third is lost or never is not coming back. A third um, is people like me. Like I said, I could not sell you my Bitcoin right now. It's I, you know off its safety deposit boxes or right wherever it's hidden. Um, and multi-sig relationships with you know my family spread across different time zones i mean i could not retrieve it and so you are determining the price of bitcoin with that final third i think we are i think that's the third that we're trading at at sixty eight thousand. that's how it's being priced so and because if you look at it that way there's no way that a hunt brother or sailor or anybody can get a third of it can get enough to manipulate it um where are you going to get it like i said you ain't going to get Satoshis. You aren't going to get the ones that are lost. And you aren't going to get the ones with guys like me that have got it locked away in multi-sig relationships. So you're, you're, you could get, you know, could you, could somebody get a million, two million, or, you know, whatever this guy that buys a hundred a day or something where, how much he's got. Yeah. But you're never going to get a third. Yeah. And, and again, I just love walking through, let's say, if someone's like, you know, Jack, let's say Bitcoin went down 50%. No, what was it? 60 something percent in a day. Then what would happen? I said, I'll tell you what would happen because it happened. I was there. Mar <laughs> March 2020, Bitcoin went all the way down to 3000. What was it trading on? It opened that day at like, I don't even remember, uh, 12,000, something ridiculous. Look it up for me, Dale, if you don't mind. It was like March 3rd, 2020. Bitcoin 
fell all the way down to 3,000 because everyone had to sell. There was so much leverage, COVID. And then what happened? Did Bitcoin die? No. It went from 3,000 to 70,000. And then <laughs> Sam Bankman freed, over levered himself to 10 billion, $10 billion. How much Bitcoin does Sailor own? Sailor owns not 10. Is his position worth 10 billion? Maybe a now it might be, but I mean, Sam Bankman Fried's hole in his balance sheet was sailor size. And then that guy put immense sell pressure on the industry. Then what happened? Oh, it went all the way down to 20,000 and then we're back. You can't, you just can't print any more of it. So as long as Bitcoin doesn't break and it continues to be distributed and it works, then demand is going to increase. And these things are a blip. They're, they're good. Turn out to be good opportunities. I just don't. Oh, I, don't, I, I, I'd say just about every major liquidation or every, Bear market in Bitcoin is tends to be a liquidation, right? Mount Gox, um, Silk Road coins, you know, with the government, um, and now you know FTT, they, they tend to be just liquidating or Genesis or whoever's liquidating out. Um, that that tends to be the story of Bitcoin bear markets, right? They don't. Yeah. I don't. I mean, do we get a sell off if the Fed? hikes rates or the stock market sells off. I mean, kind of, sort of, but um, it mostly seems to be liquidation events that, that have been the major bear markets in Bitcoin. Yeah, I just pulled up a CNBC article. Uh, it was March 13th uh, is when this was published, 2020. Um, Bitcoin, the world's first and most widely held cryptocurrency dropped 50% over two days. In more than 30% in one day, Bitcoin did. It was trading above 10,000 and hit a low of 3,000 in that period. So what would it be like if someone who was really leveraged had to market dump Bitcoin and crash the price? Guys, I've lived through that many of times. I've already been through that. I'll tell you exactly what happens is a lot of sellers, when there are more sellers than buyers, naturally, the price of something goes down. But then... As long as Bitcoin doesn't break and it's working, that's just a redistribution into new owners. And if those owners value the thing and demand continues because the monetary policy doesn't change, the software is still censorship resistant, the technology is still innovative and disruptive, then the price is going to go up because you can't make any more. So I've already lived through that. And the, the other thing too, I wanted to get your take on that is I think it's also important. I think the distribution is important. You're right. Is if Satoshi distributed Bitcoin through Jamie Dimon, it'd be a lot easier to control, right? Because Jamie right. probably would be very careful about who it got distributed to. But because distribution was fair, then it's impossible to corner this market, of course. The other, I think, is because the physical market is so liquid. Like there is no physical spot gold market that I can personally trade. The fact that I can go on to strike, wire in 50 grand, buy Bitcoin and then put it in my bedroom in about an hour is ridiculous, right? Because then the spot market is so honest. The physical asset I can put in my brain. With gold, that's not true. So a lot of gold's reliance is on the non-physical market, is on the exchanges. It's so, But the fact that I can give strike money and get physical asset in my brain makes it nearly impossible to rig a market because the physical, the spot, the spot market's so brutally honest and fair and global. Um, and so that's the other thing about Bitcoin. Because like, think about guys like barrels of oil. Like wait, there, it's the barrels of oil. Like if I wanted to wire in strike 50 grand and get physical delivery of a barrel of oil and put it in my room, it's a lot harder to keep that market honest than Bitcoin, right? So it's also the most free, the most efficient physical commodity, or I don't even know what to call it, physical scarcity, physical physical instrument. Um, that's the other part, right, Dad? I think is just, it's so different. It's it, going to be nearly impossible, in my opinion, to fuck with this market. You can push the price down as long as you want. And I've always bought those dips in the last decade of my life. Since I was 18 years old, I was taught to buy those dips. So go ahead. You guys want to push the price down? Push the price down. I'll buy it. But yeah. it's going to go back up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it seems like given a long enough time horizon, none of these events fucking matter. Um, in, what is it? April 10th, 2013, 
Bitcoin's price falls 50% in a single day from $260 to $130. That's a significant event. Don't think it fucking matters now. Uh, and then, yeah, March 12th, 2020, also known as Black Thursday. I didn't even recognize this. And I was probably, I mean, the peak of this is probably when I bought Bitcoin, knowing uh, how well <laughs> I trade. But uh, yeah, went from uh, $7,900 to $4,600 within 24 hours. Again, Got give me it. a long, long enough time horizon. This doesn't, this, none of this fucking matters. I do not even remember the last break you were talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like, like I said. So anyway, I don't think sailors, uh, the Hunt brothers, so many reasons why. But I also, I remember, like, I would see some tweet storm from some kid, like, oh well, the CM, the the futures market is really going to price suppress Bitcoin. And it's from like, um, ether God, one, two, three at, on Twitter, who doesn't know fuck all about anything. And it's just, I don't think people necessarily appreciate cause I'll get DMS on Twitter all the time. Like your family's a cardinal sin. You're here to ruin Bitcoin because your dad has a CME membership. <laughs> like fucking you guys are out of your fucking mind. This, this is so not the case. I I could do anything to Bitcoin if I tried my hardest, but no. The next time you got to defend uh, <laughs> CME's role, just remind them that uh, that the CME's derivatives products and how well they functioned was worth cited for uh, ETF approval. One of the reasons that that the judges give to to approve the ETFs is how well our derivative products have have functioned. So, I mean, think about that way. How many people are going now get access to Bitcoin that never would have prior, right? That never would have, you know, write, write your seed words down and store it and stuff that are going to be able to do it by an ETF. And, you know, among the reasons that the, uh, the ETF was approved was because of the success of those derivative products. So, well, a lot. Thanks, CME. Come on. We're, that's CME is always, um, like I said, they've, they've at least, educated themselves they didn't just let's just list it and trade it and because everyone's talking about it no they were at they were at our meetups they would send reps to chicago meetups and, and just get educated about it i will allow me to go on one of these rants here because um the cme is also the reason that during covid and lockdowns all of us didn't have diarrhea and get sick how do you guys think the commodities that you consume, that you put in your belly? So the CME created the agriculture commodity risk transfer markets so that the guy that's farming corn doesn't have to focus on the future price of the commodity he's producing. He can just focus on making good corn so that when you go into Chipotle and you order a burrito, you're not getting dog shit corn because the guy doesn't know how to manage risk in an active global commodity that you are relying on to eat. The CME created an exchange to take the risk that is to produce a commodity that we all have to eat to nourish ourselves and transfer that risk into a highly liquid, sophisticated marketplace so that you can just walk into Chipotle and know for fact you're going to eat good wheat, good corn, good beans. Now, that's an exchange that's integral to our lives, solved a real problem. And that's the problem I have with people. When people say, oh, Coinbase is the new CME, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Creating a marketplace for someone to lose their life savings on Terra Luna versus creating a marketplace to take the corn farmers risk out of the corn farmers so they can focus on building high quality produce for us and letting that risk live elsewhere. That's a just so you guys know, that's what an exchange is supposed to do is create an efficient marketplace for society to to enhance its well-being, its quality of life and allow us to focus on other things than oh shit, COVID. So when COVID happened, how do you guys think what what do you think the futures on corn was? Is anyone going to be allowed to walk out of their house and buy it? So if you were a corn farmer and you couldn't transfer that risk to someone like Don Wilson or Ken Griffin, we would all be puking on ourselves because our corn would be muddled with bacteria and shit. So that's what an exchange is supposed to do. All these shit coin exchanges. So when people shit on the CME, like you guys have no idea the like 
advancement it has allowed for. And it's now the, I think the CME is the most high volume exchange in the world, right? I mean, the options and futures markets are the highest volume traded products in the world. And so all the efficiencies that you guys have no idea are provided to you because we have such a highly liquid financial market. I don't know. It just drives, it drives me nuts. And it also hopefully goes to show like why I'm such, I, I just can't stand shitcoin exchanges. It's like, okay, so these guys in Chicago took a market that had known risk on commodities that we needed to put in our belly and they created a marketplace and a risk transfer mechanism to allow us to not even need to worry about that so that humanity can focus on bigger and better things. Now, tell me again what Binance is solving. Yeah, no, where, I where are they like seriously, they're creating a marketplace for what? For someone to be a less legally accountable central bank so that someone can print their own money in their basement like Vitalik and find consumers that don't know any better while breaking the law and sell them their own currency. If that's what if, if the CME solved or the Chicago exchanges and the New York exchanges solved real market dynamic problems, remind me what does Coinbase do? They're get they're helping people get access to Terra Luna. Have you read that subreddit of, uh, oh, I, I invest my life savings in Terra Luna. I'm going to go kill myself tonight. So what? You tell me what Coinbase does. Ridiculous. I mean, it's a, it's a casino. Yeah. That's all I it is. It's a casino. People, I just don't think people know their history. It's like, you know, whatever. Anyway. I think the best argument for your for derivatives products, when you think about it, how would you like to be, you know, going to the mining business right you've done done your homework i know how much it's going to cost i got my power sourced and um and it's going to take probably six months for this operation to to pay for you know my rent equipment well in six months as you know bitcoin like i said it, i've lived through how many 80 percent bear markets um so that guy's got two problems right he's got a forward um he's got a you know, he's got to protect himself against the price, but he also mm -hmm. has to protect against hash um, because he could, you know, you could set up your whole mining operation and then have hash power double and, and you get all your numbers are, you're, you know, are mispriced, your whole plan. So I, I think that would be the, a good next derivatives product. I'm sure I, there are. I tried to build that a long time ago. I assume those are going to come. The, the, the most difficult part about- a counter market for it. Well, that the, the so I'll, I'll, this actually will be interesting. I tried. So what you learn is the thing that miners need to hedge, or at the time I thought was the difficulty adjustment, because what's interesting about Bitcoin, like we said, is that the software will adjust itself to make sure that production is constant, so that it's stuck in a predetermined amount of time. And so if, if the difficulty of how hard it's it is to produce goes up, that's what you're hedging against. Because if I set my cost six months forward but then it gets twice as hard to produce that, but the twice as hard to produce is oftentimes not correlated to the price of the asset. It's correlated to how many people are trying to produce the asset. So if you get like Vladimir Putin decides like, Oh, I got extra energy laying around. I'm just going to plug it into the Bitcoin network. And then everything gets three times as hard for you to produce, but you already forward priced your business six, 12 months. You're like, Oh, I have 12 months of mining runway. But Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin turns it to one month because he just plugged in an extra building. Well, then you're fucked, right? So how do you hedge that? So you're, but so then the question is, who's short mining difficulty? And that's the part I couldn't create a market for that. I couldn't find the other side of that because, and and you can you can make the case that maybe it's some like someone is short. Like whoever's selling all these miners, the actual equipment maybe wants short exposure because of how long they are, assuming that people are going to continue want to mine, right? Um, so there's maybe, but I ended up just saying whoever thinks Bitcoin's going to zero is short mining difficulty, right? So I was actually, I walked into Citadel. I walked into Citadel. I walked into a lot of these big giant, this was 2000, geez. 16. Um, it was a long time ago. I walked into these and I said, if you guys think Bitcoin's actually going to zero, I'll give you exposure to that. You take the other side of Bitcoin miners. And I tried to make a market where Citadel would short mining difficulty and 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 uh, take the other side of the exposure and so that they can hedge, but it didn't work. 
um because then i founded strike so i think someone someone will figure that out though i agree with you um well looking at a bitcoin way. difficulty chart over time though i mean if you were short this thing like you're fucked right well i think mining is one of the most difficult businesses to be in i would never ever sign myself up for that i've said that on this podcast um why why don't you just buy bitcoin um <laughs> it's a lot uh, or why don't you create a business that does well and buy bitcoin i mean proof of work doesn't have to be through literally mining it proof of work could be i mean i think it's obviously very important but it's an immensely difficult business because you're effectively part of a global um all bets off no rules energy bounty on planet earth so you're when you plug in a miner you're what saying you that, yeah yeah when you plug in a miner you're saying i'm the best in the world out of all eight billion people at finding energy <laughs> you think i'm gonna sign myself up for that i mean there are guys that own and run countries and militaries i'm eventually gonna lose at that right i don't i want to be uh better at putin than harnessing energy that guy's got a, a military i don't <laughs> i don't want to play that game i'd rather I'd rather be ethical and focused and driven at being a global Bitcoin company that gives you guys the latest features and on and off ramps. I don't want to fucking compete with energy. That's too hard and unreliable and unsustainable. Anyway. Are difficulty are difficulty adjustments like reliably predictable as well? Uh what would be reliable and predictable to you? What, uh, I'm looking at some website called coinwars with a z.com and it estimates that the next difficulty will be 80.85 trillion hashes. Well, um, yeah, you can predict <laughs> you can predict the next difficulty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, think about it. Like if you, the blocks if bitcoin blocks are being solved on an average of 5 minutes instead of the target of 10, then the software is going to double the difficulty because it's doing twice as fast. So you can take a look at recent blocks and say, oh, it looks like there's more hash rate that's solving this shit because they're figuring it out a lot faster. So that's how difficulty adjustments work. But predictable, I mean, like like I said, Dill, you work for me. If we had to forward, we forward price our business in what? Quarters, years, decades, right? And we think in strategy like that. If you're a miner, can you forward price difficulty more than... The next adjustment no so yeah. if if the united states if trump came out and said you know what i think we need we need to be mining bitcoin if i get elected i'm plugging in 25 percent of this country's excess energy into the bitcoin network well there goes your mining business see ya you're blown out so it's just too impossible it's impossible <laughs> of a business to be in right um anyway um okay well let me transition uh to did you guys see this that jp morgan this just kind of blew my mind i don't even know if you can have an opinion on it but jp morgan chase the biggest bank in america and really like an extension of the fiat system and the fed and uh they came out and said that the federal reserve might change their plans on cutting interest rates according to the bitcoin pledge price because of how well bitcoin is performing the fed is nervous to cut rates and on top of that there was a tweet by one of my favorite twitter follows of all time macroscope at macroscope 17 so if you are a listener shout out to you i'm a huge fan i've been following you for years i can't read it because it's very very long tweet tweet but i encourage everyone to go check it out he writes that the approval of the bitcoin etf might have been one of the biggest mistakes uh, in U.S. fiat history because if there is an exit, people will use it. I think that's a Christine Lagarde quote that he quotes in his tweet is, if there is an exit, people will use it. So you just can't give them an exit. And how this Bitcoin ETF got approved was fascinating because it went through court, is that everyone, Diamond and Gensler, everyone tried to get in the way of it but it was through judicial court that they said you have to approve it. And now all bets are off and you're seeing the, the inflows into Bitcoin and the outflows of the fiat and the bond market and everything. And so the combination of those two, 
I never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I would wake up to a press headline that said Chase Bank thinks the Fed is going to be cautious about lowering <laughs> rates because how fast people are going to be running to Bitcoin and that the Fed is maybe taking into account how they're going to manage monetary policy because everyone now has a way out via Bitcoin ETF and it can get terrifyingly scary if they cut rates aggressively, Bitcoin might go to a million. I mean, we've been, there has been uh, monetary authorities, presidential candidates um, on and off that have proposed that, that the Fed not target short-term interest rates, but instead target something like money supply, like M2 money supply, an easier number to control because it does give it kind of that shaman-esque, right? <laughs> kind of like, um, you know, the uh, the Council of Elders meets at the top of Olympus to decide, you know, the fates of, the, of Sparta. Or, you know, it gives it that mystery nonsense um, and, you know, I think, yeah, obviously there should be more disclosure on, on how all of this is set. And I've, like I said, there's a, frequently been even, you know, political candidates that have, that have suggested um, targeting M2 money supply and not trying to target interest rates. But, For those that don't know, why would cutting interest rates lead to a higher Bitcoin price? Well, just everything at the margin just you know gets your dollars are cheaper so mortgages are more affordable car loans are more for me so if you are you know a couple of paychecks away from you know getting a new car it, it, that car just got that much cheaper right anything you got to finance if you're that far away from you know i haven't decided whether we're going to the roller coaster park in the Dells or whether we're going to splurge and, and go to Hawaii for this year's vacation. Well, it just got a little bit cheaper. Everything just gets slightly, everything at the margin just gets slightly more affordable. And it contributes to monetary expansion because following yeah. that, yeah, well, if you continue what he just said, people don't finance that with pure cash. They're financing it with credit, with mortgages, with loans. And when you borrow you're expanding the money supply. That's how printing money works is the the banks that lead up into the Fed are creating dollars out of thin air to lend you. There it's it's all fractional. So if if you can if you can afford to finance things, then the economy is going to end up printing a lot of money. And obviously the more things people are financing and the more things people are purchasing, the more dollars are going to be competing for the fixed assets and if Bitcoin's the the fixed one out of all of them it should like if, if we go back to a zero interest rate environment right now and they're going to print a lot of money to pay off all of their uh interest payments bitcoin's going to go to a million dollars overnight it's easier to see i think it's easier to see the other way if you're sitting down with your financial advisor and and you know laying out you know what do you think we um i think the election year reasonable good you know there's some dangers out there but um you know maybe inflation or whatnot but you know i think stock market could have an eight eight nine ten percent year and you've got treasury bonds that are trading at ten percent that's a no-brainer there's no way you would expose yourself to any type of risk in, in an equities market when the government will pay you a comparable rate right so i think it, as they raise rates they it's easy to see liquidity drains out of any other asset. Yeah, but that's what was interesting about the last few years mm -hmm. is they did raise rates in the bond market. I mean, they did. They sucked. They sucked a lot of money out of a lot of things, including their own banks. So we kind of went over this on one of the earlier podcast episodes, but the reason the U.S. banking system is insolvent is because the Federal Reserve sucked all the deposits out of the banking system and into this risk-free return. And so now, when you go want, you go withdraw your deposit at your bank, it's not there anymore because they don't have it. <laughs> so they did raise it so fast and so aggressively that they did suck a lot of money out. But the bond market hasn't been nearly as performant. Gold has this is the first time I think gold's gone up in such an aggressive Fed 
And yeah. so I think this is the, you know, okay, let me get your take on this one, dad, because every single financial- I go look at, I got, I, I want, I got to get my voters to the polls on election day and I don't want them walking past bank lines on their way to vote as well. I, I mean, that's just a bad look. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get elected. Can you guys um, write no more hike? I mean, those are quarter point hikes and tripped um, a couple of, you know, you got a couple of bank runs. Um, no, I, I think uh, at least at least let us get through this election year before you guys start, uh, you know, finding out who the next insolvent bank is, which you're never going to know. Right. You're never for some reason in that industry, um, you 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 find out who's insolvent when you hike. <laughs> it's hard to know prior. Well, they're all insolvent. But yeah, and the um, for the. The Federal Reserve acts as if the dollar isn't political, but of course it is. I mean, the, the chairman of the Fed is the worst job in the world because you just have to find a way to justify Washington, D.C.'s spending. I, I continue to hold the opinion. I, Dorsey was the one that really started to make me think this way when he started to talk to me and tweet that, you know, end of an empire, end of an empire. And he was talking about the U.S., and it made me think and look back at, you know, what was the Roman Empire? You know, because I learned about the Roman Empire in school. How'd that end? And usually for all empires, there's a lot of easy productivity in the beginning. So like after World War II for us, a lot of easy productivity gains. We were like the only solvent nation around. We were producing everything. Everyone needed our help. But then eventually that productivity has an end. There's no free lunch forever, but politicians don't know how to stop spending. So eventually you, the productivity is over. So th the reason the productivity is important is because you can borrow from your future because you're so productive and you're growing so fast that you can borrow from your future and pay back more than you're borrowing. But then eventually when the productivity runs out and after World War II, every, every other country around us is now producing stuff. Like people don't just want to be our bitch. People are producing things. They want to be part of the global economy. Like China and Russia clearly don't want to be our bitch anymore. Like World War II was a long time ago. We're ready to, you know, be contributors to the world again. And we aren't ready for that. And we've exceeded our production. We're not growing at all anymore. Human population is going down. And so I think the American empire, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, we're still, we could still be the greatest country in the world. We don't have to be you don't have to be spending all of this money and the, the gains are, the gains are gone. That's how every empire ends seemingly. Right. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I like, in my opinion, um, I mean, if you, I, it, it would be hard to imagine, you know, growing up in the financial markets the way I did that, um, there are more, but for a new, new asset, um, you know, Canadians, El Salvadorians have better investment options than Americans. I mean, that just I would have never expected um, that this country with so much financial dynamism could fall behind um, in, in these product offerings. But you're right. It's it's a handful of it's all it took was a handful of Morins and Genslers and um, diamonds um, and really I don't know. I don't know how you. I don't know how you turn to your voters and and say this is the best financial asset ever, and you got to work around to get along. Um, well, this is the pro. The the problem with the system is because it is political, um, and th like, if I were to run for president, and say, here's what we're gonna do, guys. One, all the like. Uh, pension payments, all your early retirement payments, the fact that your social security check is going to match inflation. How the fuck do you guys think that's possible? All <laughs> that shit is done. Is gas going to be affordable or not? I have no idea. Gas might get really fucking expensive. The fact that all of you in America are entitled to your two car garages that are guzzling up energy and gas. I don't know. Might not be for you. We're going to have to really reset this thing, find out who we are, produce our own shit and rebuild i don't know what's america world war ii is a long time ago a lot of us weren't even alive for that shit so we're gonna have to figure out who we are do you think i would get elected versus the guy that's gonna run next to me and say hey for the next four years gas is gonna be affordable 
I'm going to print more money so that you guys can all go to college for free. Who do you think is going to get elected? So not you, not me. Right. <laughs> so that's the problem. Eventually you get enough civil unrest and you can ar already start to see that we're getting there. Like look at Argentina. The guy that won the Argentina election was the guy that said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to end the central bank. This country is going to be fucking a fucking mess, but it's going to be a mess that's moving in the right direction. But Argentina had gone through enough civil unrest. They were so upset that they were like, yes, please. I'm ready to reset. This has been dog shit. And you can already start to see America get there. I was sitting last night um, with uh, a friend and she was like, you know, four years ago, I was as liberal. This is what she said. And again, if you guys are listening and you can't see me, both my hands are in the air. I am not political. I'm not left, right, blue, red. I don't give a shit. I'm orange. I'm Bitcoin. But she said, I was so blue. I was so democratic. I was so, I could have never in a million years considered to ever vote for Trump. But I'll tell you what, I'm voting for Trump. I'm telling everyone to vote for Trump if they have a brain cell. And it's because there's a lot of civil unrest building in America. People are, we're, we're finally crossing that chasm, I think personally, where people are finally starting to get pretty pissed off and lose a lot of trust in government. And I think, so I think Argentina is probably a leading indicator. I do think you get a president, uh, an American that's going to step in and say, listen, I know it's hard, but the best way forward for this country is to get back to our roots and who we are. And eventually that president will get elected. Um, but I don't think this cycle, I think this cycle there, someone, whoever gets elected is going to have to print a lot of money. Right? Yeah. I mean, I uh, just piggybacking off that point, having a conversation yesterday as well. Um, I forget what the context was, but you know, it was along the lines of, Oh, so-and-so or someone or this person makes 69 grand a year. And the comment back to that was, Oh wow. How does that person live? <laughs> right. Which is insane to think about $69,000 back in what the eighties, the fifth, you know, fifth, you know, however long you want to backwards project it. I mean that you were rich, you like, you were a Manhattan conglomerate making $69,000 a year. And now it's like, well, how is that person, you know, does that person paycheck to paycheck these days? Um, in a major metropolitan city in the United States, you probably are. Uh, you can't keep up with rent. You can't keep up with gas. You can't keep up with groceries, right? And that's starting, I mean, I think that that's starting to keep its way through uh, a lot of people's minds in terms of how they're thinking about things, what informs their decisions, what informs how they think about the people that quote unquote run this country. Um, it's just, it's super interesting. I agree. I agree. Um, well, we'll see. I mean, if the Fed starts making decisions based on Bitcoin, <laughs> that's how you know this thing's going to a kajillion. I mean, but they're stuck, right? They're stuck. And no matter what direction they go, Bitcoin's a winner. But all the banks are insolvent. Um, the government's insolvent. The only way is to print money. Um, so, uh, oh, oh, and the thing I wanted your take on, Dad, uh, that I, I sidetracked myself, um, is the bond market. Because every single financial crisis, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's all price fixing. So some sector of America or the financial market at large fails. And these bailouts are effectively price fixing and propping up things that are falling apart. Uh, and so you've seen that happen in industry after industry after industry after industry to the point where now risk is fully institutionalized. There's no such thing as like when I deposit at a bank, I hold the risk to the bank. We're all like this whole thing is either going to continue to get propped up or it's all coming down. And this one feels kind of like the final boss. And I, and I want to get your opinion on it because that's how everyone always feels is like this next moment is the moment, but it's never the case. Right. But it, to me, it kind of feels like it because this time what they're going to have to effectively price fix and prop up is the bond market. Right. Um, which is the holy mother Mecca of markets. It's the most liquid, biggest financial market in the history of mankind. But this is the one, because what in 2000, 2000, 2008, 2009, it was real estate. Right. And the fixed swaps and mortgages. This time, it's the bond market that's the problem. So the amount of money 
that they're going to have to print to fix that market, it feels to me like this is like the Super Bowl of bailing people out that's going to have to ensue, which is why I've always said I think my Bitcoin price prediction is somewhere between 250 and a million at some point in 2025. Do you, but do you agree with the like history of effectively just picking up something that fell apart, price fixing it, propping it up and trying to keep the, the train going? And now we're kind of at like final boss, the last, the last chapter, the end of the video game where they're going to try and fix the bond market and give it one last swooping hurrah of like more money. I, if I do the math on paper, I mean, they're going to have to print orders of magnitude more money than they did in COVID, which is orders of magnitude more money than they've ever printed before, which is orders of magnitude, which is orders. So it keeps, it keeps going. I'm with you. I don't know how it ends, but um, yeah, it, you got to get as reasonably fixed as you can. Um, like I said, real estate, obviously precious metals, Bitcoin's a better version of both in terms of auto you know being able to audit the scarcity of it but yeah you gotta be able to protect yourself because i i i agree i don't see any way that you can you know manage that amount of debt that, that you can satisfy all the um you know all the all the debt payments and have an election year and you know not not find out who's next uh in insolvency i i think you're gonna have to pay the higher prices i mean that's only that's the only escape valve that i see because i don't think default um is an option obviously so there's only de only devaluation or and debasement um that's what i do right I'm, <laughs> i wouldn't let's find out right who's who's truly too big to fail all right i'll i'll get your answer for you i'll, I'll hike interest rates the full percentage point and we'll find out who who doesn't open on monday right that's what we've done so far that's how that's how we figured out svb yeah. was insolvent right um and i just i just i don't see that i'm sorry you guys are gonna have to pay you know more for groceries and we're just gonna blame that on putin anyways yeah yeah i just think that the orders of magnitude you just do the math of the indebtedness of all of these nations and um, the fact that the bond market is the one that's now falling apart is that the amount of money in that market is because what was 2008 to you? That was, that was a uh, real estate market, right? Yeah. Right. So that like, and so guys, I'm only, I'm not, old enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm not old enough to have the history of all the financial collapses, but in 2008, that was the real estate market fell apart and they had to come in and fix that because real estate is too important of an asset to have it collapse on everyone because it's where everyone's wealth is stored ever since they started printing money, right? But mm -hmm. now, okay, so they price fixed real estate. Okay, great. Now the bond market. Now whose money is stuck in the bond market? Nations. Country is the biggest market in the world. Yeah. So they're going to come in and try and fix price that. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's going to a million. Sorry. <laughs> but I, I see, I swear to God. I mean, they're going to have to print 10 trillion globally, globally, like through all the central banks. Cause you're talking about, I mean, you're talking about the bond market. You're talking about the uh, Chinese central bank, Japanese central bank, European central bank, American central bank. I mean, that's five, 10, $15 trillion of money printing. And, What's that going to do the Bitcoin price? I think easily a million. Uh, <laughs> but what we, I, I will hedge myself. We say it all the time. You're, you guys are asking me to uh, price something in a piece of paper these guys print. So if they don't print that much, then yeah, I don't know. We comfortably find 500,000. But I think in 2025, you'll see an egregious amount of stimulus. And well, this year, but in 2025, I think Bitcoin could hit a million because of that. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, what about, uh, some Q and A I'm looking at the clock. Um, what about some Q and A Lito? Yeah, let's get into it. We got, uh, we got some questions this week. Uh, we're going to start with Ray Williams. Uh, same question I ask every week. Apologies, Ray. That never gets answered. Who would win in chess, Jack or sailor? 
<laughs> I, I think I already answered this. Are we betting money on this? Then Jack will win. Jack will Jack will hustle if there's if there's a if there's a couple hundred dollars on the table. Um, I don't. I uh, no. That's how. That's what Jack Jack used to just you know hit the Chicago lakefront. We've got one of those pavilions. I'm sure you know New York's got got it in uh, Washington Square Park. I think um, <laughs> where you just you can just hustle. What do you guys pay? Five bucks a game, ten bucks or something, and just yeah. hustle yeah. all day long. Um, if Sailor shows up in uh, in that scene, I I'll, I'm I'm going with Jack. I was gonna say, fuck the Chicago waterfront. This guy used to hustle the Evanston Township High School lunchrooms, and by <laughs> hustle, I mean I played him once where we bet my lunch money that he could beat me in five seconds, and uh, I lost my lunch money. And I've never played Jack and Chess since. <laughs> no, getting getting the piece moved to the right square and hitting the clock in under a second and a half boom 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 right is that i mean yeah i thought he was out of his fucking mind yeah i thought he was out of his fucking mind i'm like five seconds all right this is gonna be you know i'm getting double the bosco sticks today and it turns out that i got no bosco sticks that day i said i would play sailor and sailors everyone knows now the guy that orange pilled sailor his name's eric eric said they don't want to play me I was like, mm. I, well, I actually, actually was just with Sailor in Portugal. I love Sailor. I consider him a good friend. I uh, So I should have asked him. But um, if you guys ever want to play me, I'm down to play. Um, I would even say, Eric, I will bet just for fun, I would bet a certain amount of sats. Next conference we're at, I'll play you blindfold. Now that you'd really be the favorite there. I will I will play blindfold, so I would have to just talk out. You'd tell me the, where the pieces are, and I'll tell you my moves without seeing the board, and we'll play for sats. You'd have to be the favorite there, but you guys got to play me because Eric would hit, hit me up all the time like, oh, Sailor and I are getting really getting into chess, man. We love it. Now I can see why you love the game so much. I'm like, oh, really? Let's play. Oh, no, we're not fucking playing. You fuck you. Like, well. No, that's what I do. You go, I'll talent. First, I'll play you in chess blindfolded. Then I'll will go to the three point line and I'll keep the blindfold on and I'll beat you there too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you got to get some up on sailor because he kicks our ass and um, whoever can accumulate the most Bitcoin wins. He's beating my ass. <laughs> he's, he's winning in that one. So you got to give me chess, but uh, no, I don't know. I don't know how good he is. I don't know. I'd love to play him all jokes aside. And uh, I, he's sailors come up a few times in this podcast. And just to be clear, I love Michael. I've got to spend time with him. He's as bright as advertised, even brighter. And uh, I think he's one of the better things that's happened to Bitcoin in recent years. And I'm super thankful for him. Uh, and I do think I'd kick his ass in chess, but he's the best. He's the best. Nice. KKV asks, is it feasible for someone like BlackRock to essentially do what London bullion market does with suppressing the price of gold? That is, if they accumulate a large enough share and then use it to manipulate the price. Love the show. I mean, I think we already answered. I, I he's got he's a long way from a third of it and is not going to be able to get that, no matter how hard you try. Um, yeah, no, I think we already answered. I, I think Bitcoin uh, early days of being worthless, where and you know the issuance schedule, you know it um just flooded and it, it's evenly enough distributed now so i do not think um it can be even with an etf or a sailor or some middle eastern emirate i don't think can ever get a critical mass so that they can manipulate the price mm. i just think it's too evenly distributed and then there's like i said a third a third a third a third is lost or is satoshi's a third is guys like me who's in a multi-sig relationship locked in a safe somewhere and the third the other third is the third we're trading and um and you know you're not going to be able to get any of the first two thirds right you're that's how you set the price of bitcoin on that final you know the final third is how it's being priced and it's just my opinion but yeah um, and I also think it was everything else we discussed too. Like, I mean, so, so she could yeah. come back. You could unearth his coins. 
I suppose. Um, ETFs could fail. I mean, there's, there's still a market. Well, it's but still, I, I think I think two thirds of this stuff is inaccessible. It's still. Um, I mean, Satoshi's what a twentieth of the market. Sailors a mm -hmm. one uh, hundredth of the market. So these are still tiny numbers, and uh, I still think all the other things matter too, like how efficient the spot market is versus gold. Like the fact that you guys can wire into strike and withdraw out into your cold storage, the, the, the physical market is just a different beast than gold or than oil or than corn. It is going to be nearly impossible, and I dare him to try. That's the other thing too, guys. Like if BlackRock started to suppress Bitcoin and you guys woke up tomorrow and Bitcoin was at 10K, I think Strike would have its biggest day ever by a mile. You guys going to sit there and watch 10K Bitcoin? And so then, so then what? So then, so you're right because, because the physical is so accessible. The problem with the gold market is what? If you woke up, where would you, would you have to go meet up to, with someone in the park to go get physical spot gold? You can't do it on your Robinhood account or your Strike account. So I dare BlackRock to try. Go ahead. Go suppress the Bitcoin price by 50% tomorrow and I'll buy it and we'll see. We'll go, go for it. I just think it's, it's, I don't like the comparison to gold in these hypotheticals because it's a totally different asset. I think that's a great point and I would be buying uh, as well. Okay, last question. Damien Draco asks, if you could orange pill one person on earth, who would it be? That's a good question. Um, one person on earth. I'll let you guys think about it. I'll probably yeah, regret this answer a lot. Uh, but off the top of my head, gut reaction, I would say... Elon Musk. Uh, I think if the guys get at one thing and one thing only, it's marketing. Um, Tesla trades, what, 25x revenue. No automakers ever been able to see that type of multiple ever uh, in the public markets. And so for me, it would be, it would be Elon Musk. Uh, I think he's an unbelievable marketer. I think he has the attention of the entire planet uh, when he speaks. And yeah, it would be Elon Musk. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I, Dwayne the Rock. Dwayne the Rock. That's what Bitcoin Mom wants. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Um, I, I think Apple is. I think Apple's. I know people look at market caps and stuff, but it's all such a shit coin because everyone now knows the S and P five hundred and stocks are treated as not. They're they're treated more as money than they are as actual investments because of printing of ca of currency. But I think Apple is the most impressive company. It's the most important company as far as technological innovation. I mean, what they've done with the iPhone. Um, I, the problem, though, is I don't know if Tim Cook is the right person. Uh, I'd be shocked if he was the CEO for very much longer. I mean, he's getting old, I think. They're stopping. Growth is slowing down. There hasn't been innovation in years. But whoever the right person is at Apple, I uh, I think if that company um, understood Bitcoin, the world the world would be um, a way better place. Like if Apple was using Bitcoin and Lightning, and I mean it's a global company that ships global hardware. So I think Apple would entirely disrupt self-custody bitcoin i think they'd entirely disrupt private keys on device i think they'd entirely disrupt access to it i think they'd entirely entirely disrupt payments um i think they're the best positioned business to use a uh a distributed currency for the world so if someone can orange bill apple i think that is that would be yeah if like bitcoin was a native currency embedded in iMessage, i mean yeah one time i told dorsey uh Hopefully this podcast isn't, I don't think it is big enough to like get people all wound up. But I told Dorsey once, I was like, you know, if I were uh, controlling the universe, what I would do is I would make you the CEO of Apple somehow. Because I that, that, like, I swear to God, I've thought about it. It's like, man, if so, if the right guy was running Apple um, and had a focus, and it's very much within their culture, um, Bitcoin, I think. Uh, well, for me, it would be um, Amazon. Just um, mm -hmm. it's another good one. 
I, I have no idea, but I mean, that's, it's funny how, um, you know, Bitcoin adoption has changed because back when, when we started, it was, you were encouraged to spend it transaction, you know, try to get the grocery guy to take it, try to get, you know, the bike shop to take it, right. And get it circulating. Whereas now I don't think anybody spends Bitcoin, right. It's, it's, it, it's more yeah. popular just for DCAing into and holding. Um, yeah. But back to when we thought adoption would spread through particularly online retailers, why in the world Amazon, eBay aren't there? I mean, why are you guys monkeying around with credit cards? You know, how difficult, how, how expensive is it for Amazon to protect all that data? Yeah. Um, the, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Like one of those, I'm never used to that. One of those big companies, to be clear, by the way, when I made the put joke, it the first, put it down at the bottom. Yeah. Right. You've got, You've got options. You got like Visa, PayPal. Just put another put a QR code down at the bottom. I've never understood why um, Bitcoin hasn't seen more online retail adoption. There's just not there's not enough demand for it. I get. I mean, we've had this conversation. I get it. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, one of these companies. I because I did. I made the joke to Dorsey. And he said, "Fuck no. I'm I'm the CEO of Block. I'm not." Um, but. Uh, I, can you guys imagine? So, like, I got an iPhone. Can you imagine? The, the the thing about Apple is they are the most integral because everyone else, like Facebook is this big, or Meta is big, awesome company. Guess where their products sit on, on this, right? And so Apple is, in my opinion, the most dominant, most integral business. Can you imagine if when I got my new iPhone, this was also a self-custody device? Yeah. Where I got my iPhone and they also gave me like a little pin too. And when I bought Bitcoin, my private keys by Apple was engineered and they would ship me something else that I can I can lock in a safety deposit box or in a safe. And it also came with lightning payments and easy on ramp. And, you know, people all over the world use the iPhone. So you get easy self custody access to, to Bitcoin and it's a it's a digital bearer instrument and Apple ships hardware. It's a software company. Man, I think if everyone that had an iPhone had really amazing Bitcoin access, I mean, I think that was that'd be hyper Bitcoinization. We wouldn't we'd start pricing things in Sats at that point. So whoever can orange pill Apple, um, that'd be good. I'll take it. Apple, Amazon, Apple, We're Amazon, Elon Musk, I guess. <laughs> I know an hour from now I'm gonna be like shit, <laughs> but gut reaction, to Elon. Cool. Is that uh that the last question? It's the last question. All right. Well, this was a good one. Um, and thank you guys. Let me pull up uh, our YouTube as as we end it. We're now past on YouTube. I think we're at nine point two seven k subscribers, and I know we got more listeners. Then we do video watchers. So on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts, a lot of people are listening. So we really appreciate it. If you guys can subscribe and like it and all that stuff, I know it matters and continue to support us and give us feedback. If you guys, sometimes you guys say, man, I hate when you do that. Good. Uh, thanks for letting me know because I won't do it again. Or let us know what you like. Let us know what you guys want us to talk about. Um, we just really enjoy it. So thanks for tuning in like and subscribe and uh, we will talk to you guys next week. See ya.